Hi, my name is Tracy from Anesthetic Billing and IFC Services. If you are a newly qualified anesthetist or new to private billing in anesthetics in Australia, then you've come to the right place. This is a presentation I give annually to fellows at Prince of Wales Hospital in Randwick. And I've also given it in the part three course for the ASA in New South Wales. I developed this presentation because a lot of my clients are newly qualified anaesthetists and they are confused about how they go about their billing. So I put this presentation together to clear up a lot of things that people get wrong and to explain to you how the system works. For some background, I have qualifications in finance, law and accounting. I spent a career as an investment banker. My husband is an anaesthetist and I began doing his billing for him because I'm a bit of a control freak. And I began doing some of his colleagues billing as well as a business after I had children. We now look after about 100 anaesthetists and we treat each one of them like they my husband. They, each one of them is an extremely important client. Um, so to begin, when can you bill? You're allowed to bill for an anaesthetic in association with surgery um, when the MBS, which is the Medicare Benefit Schedule, has this red circled anaesthetic thing in brackets. Um, you can see the highlighted item number here, item 41672 is the surgical item number. So that's what the surgeon will bill for a reconstruction of the nasal septum. You as the anaesthetist would bill something different, but you know because it's got this anaesthetic in brackets that you are allowed to bill and your patient can get Medicare benefits because it's got this in brackets. Anesthetic billing is very special compared to all other medical specialties. That's because everything is based on a relative value guide. It's calculated on a per unit value. So the units for each service you provide reflect the complexity of the service and the total time that the service takes. Each unit has a dollar value and I will get to the dollar values much later in this presentation and it doesn't distinguish between how you anesthetize the patient, as in whether, whether you use a general or a local anesthetic, you are being remunerated for providing the appropriate service for your patient. There are multiple components of a typical anesthetic bill. Um, there are four basic components. The first one will be a pre-anesthetic consultation. This may happen on the day of surgery. It may happen on a day prior to surgery. Um, but it typically, unless in exceptional circumstances, needs to be in person. It's not a telephone call. There, the second component is the initiation units. And this is the item number that reflects the type of surgery that the patient actually had. So with our example from the previous slide, this would say something like anesthesia for something to do with the nose. If there are two surgical procedures that happen on the day, you would, and there are therefore two corresponding anesthetic initiation units, you're only allowed to bill one and you bill the one of the highest unit value. You get paid for your time as well. That's where anesthesia is different to all other medical specialists. And this reflects the total anesthesia time. It does not include the pre-anesthetic consultation. And the last component of your bill are any modifying units. And these recognize certain added complexities for that particular patient. Here's an example of a typical anaesthetic bill, one of the most common services. This is, the second item here is the initiation item number, and it's for an upper gastrointestinal endoscopic procedure. So this is a gastroscopy or an endoscopy. So typically on this bill, there will be some sort of pre-anaesthetic consultation. Usually it's quite quick. I've used the short consultation here, which is up to 15 minutes. We've got the initiation item. So this says that you provide an anesthetic for an endoscopy. There is a time, there is an item number that reflects the duration of the procedure. This was a reasonably long one. It was somewhere between 41 and 45 minutes. And that gives you three anesthetic units. And this particular patient had some sort of, um, he, he was ASA three, which gives you this modifying unit. Um, the patient had some sort of systemic disease or illness. 
I'll go into more detail about all of these things in, in later in the presentation. But what you can see here for each item number, there is a fee and that's the Medicare benefit schedule fee and Medicare pays 75% of that. And I will get into that later as well. So going in more detail into each of those components, the first thing is on each bill is usually the pre-anesthetic consultation. The vast majority of procedures will have this short consultation code, 17610. It's a limited examination of up to 15 minutes. Um, you don't have to put a stethoscope to the patient's throat, but you would, I mean, to the patient's chest, but you probably would be you know, checking their airway and getting a brief history. If the patient is more complex or the procedure is particularly complex, you may have a more detailed history. Uh, the 17615 is for 16 to 30 minutes. The 17620 is for 31 to 45 minutes, etc. But these billing these item numbers come with um, other requirements about taking notes and um, keeping records. There has to be a reason to build these higher value consultations. These item numbers begin with the number one. They are not unit number. They are not unit based. So there is no unit value to these. I'll talk more about this later. The initiation unit. So this is the one that describes the type of surgery the patient was having. These initiation units always begin with a description that says anesthesia for to distinguish them from the actual surgical procedure. And the item number always begins with the number two, and there are five digits in it. As I said before, when more than one of these initiation units applies, you choose the relevant one with the highest unit value. And when multiple procedures are performed, again, you can only build one of them, but you choose the one with the highest unit value. Time units, modifying units, and other services, beginning with the item number two, only apply, so you can only bill for them, if you have one of these anesthesia base items on your bill. So it's incredibly important to have an anesthesia based item number on your bill. And you need to be aware that if you don't, you cannot bill for your time and you can't charge any modifying units. Time units, this is how they calculated. They begin when you commence exclusive and continuous care of the patient. So that is typically when you start prepping them to give the anesthetic. It does exclude the pre-anesthetic consultation. And the time ends when the anaesthetist is no longer in attendance. So typically it's when you've handed the patient over to the nurses in recovery. And Medicare does require that you keep a note of every start and every end time, and that is transmitted to Medicare when you put your claims in. The time units, um, the, way they, the way they accrue is for the first two hours, you get one unit for each 15 minute period or part thereof. So if your procedure is an hour and a half, that would be worth six units. If it's two hours, it's worth eight units. Beyond the first two hours, you accrue one unit for every 10 minutes. So the third hour will get you an extra six units, whereas the first two hours together would have got you eight. Modifying units. So these are additional things you can bill if they apply. Uh, the most common ones would be age modifiers. So for very young patients, those are under four years of age, you get one unit. For very old patients, you also get one unit and that is now over 75 years. For the physical status of the patient, so whether they ASA three, four or five, you get an extra one, two or three units respectively. And that is for you to decide whether they ASA three, four or five. And if there's a requirement for emergency surgery, then you also get some modifying units. If the surgery is in hours, then the item number is 25020. And if and you get an extra two units for in hours emergency surgery. If the surgery is out of hours, and that's after 8 p.m. on a weekday or any time on a weekend, then you get a 50% loading on any item number that begins with the number two. So here's a bit more information about emergency surgery. This is in the out of hours, this 25025 is in the out of hours time period. 
Um, this is the description. It's when a patient requires immediate treatment without which there would be significant threat to life or body part. This is a judgment call that you make. Nobody can decide that for you. If more than 50% 50, 50 of the procedure time, of the anesthetic time, was in the after hours period, then this 25025 would apply. Now, if you have some sort of elective surgery that is scheduled for a Saturday, that is not emergency surgery and you cannot build this item number. And as I said, the fee is derived by adding 50% to all the other item numbers on the, the bill that begin with the number two. So that's why I've excluded the pre-anesthetic consult. It begins with the number one. It's 17610 typically. There are some other services that you can bill for on the anesthetic invoice in association with anesthesia. So that is within the anesthetic timeframe, but they are limited. So they include the item numbers in this range. So this one, 22002 is the administration of autologous blood. 22012 is one of the most common ones. That is for blood pressure monitoring. Now you may be measuring more than one type of blood pressure during the procedure. So if you put in an arterial line and a central line, then you would probably be monitoring the blood pressure arterially and the central venous blood pressure. So you would bill two 22012s during that service. This is the item, item number for the cannulation for a CVC. And this is the item number for a cannulation for an arterial line. Another item you can bill in association with anesthesia is 22031, which is an intrathecal epidural injection, but specifically for post-operative pain. So you may use this with a cesarean section or perhaps with hip or knee surgery, but very specifically, this is only for post-operative pain relief. Blocks. You as anaesthetists do a lot of blocks for various reasons. There are very limited circumstances in which you can put a Medicare item number onto an invoice for a block you perform during an anaesthetic service. They are the cause of much confusion for our clients. So I've got this in there to hopefully clarify the issue for new consultants. So only block items beginning with the number two can be used in association with anaesthetic accounts. So this is a finite list as of today, which is November 2022, of the blocks that can be used with an anaesthetic account. Item 22031, we discussed on the previous slide. So that's a block in the back for post-operative pain. 22036 is a top-up of that block for post-operative pain. So perhaps there was a cannula in situ and you just did a top-up during the cesarean section, you may be only billing the 22036 for the post-operative pain relief. 22041 is a plexus block, and that is for post-operative pain relief in the arm or leg. There, and there is nothing for general surgery blocks. You may be doing um, intercostal blocks or various other blocks on, on the body. There are no item numbers associated with that. That's not to say you shouldn't be performing the blocks. You should be treating your patients as you believe is best for them, but there's nothing you can reflect on your invoice as far as an item number goes for any other blocks. The only other one is this 22042, which is a peribulbar eye block, which you can bill for. Now, if you are doing a standalone pain service, that is not an anesthetic invoice. It doesn't have an induction item number, which begins with the item two, item with the number two. So typically these blocks begin with the numbers one eight. And they the most typical or common one you will see is a 18216, which is an epidural for a patient in labor. So a lady's in labor, you come in to put a block and you have just provided a pain service to that patient. You may have done a pre-block um, consultation on her. There is an item number you can bill for that, but you don't get to bill for your time and you don't get to bill any modifiers. This item 18216 covers you for up to an hour of time when you're putting that block into the patient. Okay, this slide is about patients having multiple services on the same day. 
So common ones we see would be a patient who has an epidural for labor and then later has a cesarean section. Or it may be a patient who has some sort of spinal surgery and has a bleed and there's an emergency take back. When we process these bills, we find that Medicare often rejects the invoice for the second service because its software sees same patients, same day, and it assumes we've duplicated the claim. So what we need to do is we need to provide start and end times for each of the services to Medicare so that we can explain to them, look, there were two services on the same day. These are when they happened, and this is why there were two. Sometimes we do require the name of the other anaesthetist if you weren't the person who did both of the services. I touched on this earlier. There are two different types of accounts that anaesthetists typically send out. The one on the left are the more, more common ones. I call them the anesthesia four. So this is when the patient had a surgical service or a procedural service, and you were the anaesthetist anaesthetizing the patient so that that proceduralist or surgeon could provide the service. Most bills are of this type. Um, these ones do attract the time units and the modifiers. And um, there's almost always at least three item numbers on the bill, being the pre-anesthetic consult, the initiation item number, and the duration, the time. The column on the right are the standalone procedures. So the most typical would be an epidural for labor or perhaps the insertion of a pick line, you as the anaesthetist are the proceduralist. There is no surgeon involved or there is no um, gastroenterologist involved. So because of that, no time units apply, no modifiers apply. The item numbers you build cover you for the time of your service. And there are no emergency modifiers for this. Usually there's only one or two item numbers on your bill. So the procedure item number for your labor epidural is a 18216 and your pre-procedure consult in that case is 17680. So that is for a patient in labor. So how do you actually do your billing? Well, assuming you've got some third party doing it for you, or even if you're doing it yourself, you'll need to make records. This is a sample of a PDF document that I give to my clients. It's just one way that people can give me billing information. It allows them to record the information that's required for me to do the billing and it also gives them a record for future if Medicare ever asks any questions about what they were billing. Uh, there's this big box over here which is a place to paste the hospital sticker uh, which generally gives basic information, name, date of birth, address, phone number, Medicare number, health fund name, and health fund membership number. If you don't have a sticker, you could just write it in. I've taken this top box, and on the next slide, um, I have given, I've shown you an example. This is a real example of a case that one of my clients did. So he put the sticker in here for the patient, and he has then completed all of these fields for me that apply. So the first thing he's given me is the date of service. Um, you can see in this case, the patient's admission date was actually a while before the date of service. So this patient must have been in hospital for a while. Um, he has given, told me that he did a short consultation on the patient. So he ticked the 17610. That's just up to 15 minutes. He has given me the procedure item number. So this is usually the second item on each bill. It's the one that if you have a valid one, it will attract time item numbers as well as any modifiers that may apply. Um, this service is for debridement of debridement wounds right knee and calf and on the next few slides I'll show you where he may have found this 21321 item number. He's given me the start and end times which are required for record keeping purposes and to send to Medicare when you do your claims and your billing software should be able to calculate the correct time item number to apply to this service based on the start and end times. This particular patient is an ASA 4 patient, so he's ticked P4 here. The item number is 25005 and it attracts two additional RVG units for this service. Um, in this case, you can see the patient is old, he's 87 years old, and based on the age of the patient and the date of service, your software should be able to calculate that the patient should have an age modifier, in this case, a very old, as opposed to a very young 
age modifier and there's an extra one unit for that. And in this case, it also became, it was an emergency service and it was done during regular hours. So it adds two units on to the value of the service. If it was done in the after hours period, it would have it would have been item 25025, and that would have added a 50% loading onto all of the items that begin with a two on this invoice. So that would have been this age modifier, the ASA4 modifier, the procedure item number, and the duration. It would not add any loading onto the pre-op consult because that item number begins with a one. It isn't actually an anesthesia item number. It is a consultation item number. Now, question is, how did our doctor find 21321? If you're a member of the ASA, you may have a copy of their Relative Value Guide Handbook, or you may have their app where you can access these, this information on your phone. If you are not a member, you can find all the information. Oh, sorry, just going back a step, this doctor asked us to no gap the service, so he ticked, ticked no gap here, and we would have sent the bill off to Medicare and this patient's health fund, which is BUPA. Um, so where do you find this information if you're not an ASA member? Well, you can find it all for free on the MBS online. So this is a database maintained by Medicare with all of the current item numbers, their fees and their descriptors. So you, if you know what you're looking for, you can actually type an item number in here into the search MBS section and it will give you the description and the fees for any particular item number. If you don't actually know where to start, don't worry, you go over here to the advanced search section, click on that and you'll be taken to the advanced search screen. Um, from there in the first drop down list, you will select category three, which are therapeutic procedures. That's what applies to anaesthetist. In the next drop down list for the group, you will select group T10, which is the relative value guide for anesthesia. And finally, in the subgroup, this is where you will start searching for the appropriate item number for the surgical service that occurred. So when you click on the subgroup drop down list, you will get a list of areas of the body. It starts at the top with the head, it goes all the way down to the toes. And then it starts up at the shoulder again and goes down to the hands. And then there are a few categories at the end for other services that anaesthetists provide. So in this case, if you recall, the patient had a debridement of the wound to the knee and popliteal area. So um, our, doctor, our doctor would have selected this number 11, subgroup 11. When you click on that, it gives you some options. If we look at this first option, it is for item 21300, the description is initiation of management of anesthesia for procedures on the skin or subcutaneous tissue of the knee and or popliteal area. That sounds like it's quite likely to be the correct item number for this service, but a doctor then would have read on to the next descriptor, which is this one, 21321. Similar description, but the difference here is it's procedures on the nerves, muscles, tendons, fascia or bursa of the knee and or popliteal area. Now, I wasn't there in theatre, but the doctor was, and I'm going to assume, because our doctor did select item 21321, that nerves, muscles, tendons, fascia, or bursae of that area were affected by this debridement. And therefore, there are actually two item numbers that may have applied to the service. So our doctor then would have had to go and look at the unit values applied to each of these services. So the top one has three units, and the second one has four units. And as I told you before, where two item numbers apply to the same service, you can only bill for one of them and you always select the one with the higher unit value. And that's why he selected item 21321. Right, you may have a big question. What is one of these RVG units worth? Um, well, it depends who, who you ask. The Medicare says that one RVG unit is worth $20.95. Medicare theoretically should be escalating this um, amount with CPI or some other measure, but that doesn't necessarily happen. And I'll show you on the next slide uh, what the effect of that is. The AMA, so the Australian Medical Association, has told us that as of the 1st of November 2022, one unit is worth $94. So this is the doctor's association. So doctors say that the service is worth $94. Medicare says it's worth about $21. Um, private health funds in Australia acknowledge that it is definitely worth more than this $21. 
uh, but they do not acknowledge that it's worth what the doctors say it is, which is $94. And they come in right pretty low down on the scale and they have come up with their own fee schedules of what these services are worth. Um, generally, let's call it approximately $34. You can see that each health fund or group of health funds has a different amount, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to call that no gap amount $34. So that's the amount that between the health fund and Medicare, you would receive if you no gap a patient who's insured with this health fund. So when you're deciding what you're going to be charging your patients, you need to figure out what you're worth. Um, I would recommend that you put a boundary on the bottom of $20.95 because that's what Medicare says it's worth and it's definitely worth more than that. And the AMA says it's worth $94 you are probably going to choose something somewhere in the middle and um, where, what you choose is up to you. So why is there this huge discrepancy between the $21 and the 94? That's because when Medicare first came into being back in the mid eighties, the MBS rate was set at the value of the service. So back in those days, the AMA rate and the Medicare rate coincided. What's happened subsequent to that is there's been inflation and Medicare has not kept up with inflation. So whenever they've got budgetary constraints, Medicare has refused to escalate the Medicare scheduled fee, or they haven't escalated in accordance with inflation. So what's happened is over the last 30 something years, there's been this massive gap between what Medicare is currently valuing a service at and what the AMA is valuing a service at. To help reach, bridge this gap, the private health funds firstly will make a contribution towards medical services when the patient is when the patient is insured, and they will therefore pay up to that no gap rate, which we've called thirty four dollars per unit. As well as that, all health funds now in Australia will allow you to charge an additional payment to the patient, which is called either a known gap or a co-payment. And for most of the health funds, um, the, there is a limit on that gap of $500 per service. So that's a course of anaesthetic treatment. Um, Grand United is a bit different. They have limited that known gap to $400 per service. When you do begin practicing, you will be asked to sign up with each of the health funds. Basically, that's to give them your provider number or provider numbers, as well as the corresponding banking details into which you'd like them to make payments when you make claims, when you make no gap claims directly to them. Um, when you sign up with Bupa, HCF and NIB, you get to choose which of their two schemes. So each of them has two schemes you sign up to. Bupa and HCF schemes operate the same way. If you sign up to their no gap system, they pay you a slightly higher unit rate. So it's more than $34 per unit, but you're never allowed to charge this additional $500 per service and still have them contribute the um, $34 per unit. If you did sign up to one of their no gap schemes and you wanted to charge more than the no gap rate, you are allowed to charge more but Bupa and HCF will actually pay less towards the service. So their contribution will drop as your fee increases. And I will show you on the following slides how that looks. I know it doesn't make logical sense, but it does actually happen. If, however, you have signed up to their known gap scheme, so Bupa has a known gap scheme, HCF has a known gap scheme, then you're allowed to charge up to $500 per service without Bupa or HCF pay, contributing less than that $34 per unit to get, together with Medicare. If you do choose to charge more than that $500 limit, you are still allowed to, but again, Bupa or HCF will pay, contribute less to the service. NIB has something very new called Gapshore. That is a scheme where they actually contribute a generous $41 per unit together with Medicare for a service, but it is extremely limiting in two particular ways. The first one is that um, this $500 per service known gap can only be charged if the base item number for the anaesthetic service is worth five units or more. So in our previous example with the wound debridement, the base anaesthetic item number that was selected was worth four units. So in that case, the doctor 
is not allowed to charge a known gap at all um, because it's less than a five unit base item number. The other restriction is that there are no circumstances where you can charge more than this $500 gap or if the service is worth less than five units for the base item, you can never charge more than their $41 per unit. So NIB really restricts the way you can charge for services if you choose to sign up to their known gap scheme. And the other issue with it is it applies to every single one of your item numbers. So you may do work in two completely different hospitals with two completely different demographics of patients and types of surgeries, but you are restricted in how you can bill in the same way if you sign up to this NIB gap show. HCF and BUPA don't restrict you in that way. You can choose a known gap um, selection for, for example, a private hospital that you work in, but when you work in the public system, you may no gap all your patients and therefore sign up to their no gap scheme. So it's all very confusing. I've put together a few charts to demonstrate who actually pays what for an anaesthetic service. So let's say you have a patient who comes along and they have no insurance, but they do have Medicare. And for whatever reason, you feel particularly sorry for them and you don't want them to pay anything out of pocket. So you say you'll bulk bill the service. Medicare pays 75% of the scheduled fee for in-hospital services. Um, this is some poor rounding where 75% of $20 and 95 cents has become $15. Um, that's because it used to be $20, um, the scheduled fee. So let's say Medicare contributes 15 to $16 per unit for the service. No matter how you bill the patient, Medicare always contributes the same, 75% of the scheduled fee. If this patient instead did happen to have private health insurance, they um, the private health and they were covered, then you could no gap the patient. So what that would mean is Medicare will always contribute their fifteen dollars. The private health fund will top that up to whatever the private health fund's fee schedule is, and the average was around thirty four dollars, and you will get a total of thirty four dollars for the per unit for that service and the patient will pay nothing. So that's a no gap means the patient has no gap and you will accept whatever the health fund schedule is for that service. If you decide, um, given the AMA rate is now $94 per unit, that you're actually worth more than that and you select say $52 per unit for your the value of your service, how does it look on the bill? Well, Medicare always pays the same. They pay their $15 per unit. The health fund will be happy in most cases, if it's a known gap health fund, to top that up to $34 per unit. So the health fund pays the same as if you no gap the patient. And then the patient will pay the known gap, which in this case is the balance of the fee being $18 per unit, and you will receive $52 per unit. If, however, you had signed up for Bupa's no gap scheme or HCF's no gap scheme, and you still wanted to receive your $52 per unit, you were allowed to charge the patient that. So you send the patient a bill for $52 per unit. But this is how the payments work. Medicare always pays their $15 per unit. But because the, this is a no-gap health fund and you are not a, allowed to charge the patient an additional contribution as well as no-gapping the health fund, the health fund actually penalises the patient and pays less they only pay the balance of the fee up to the Medicare scheduled fee. So between Medicare and the health fund, they're paying that $20.95, poorly rounded here. And therefore the patient has to pay the balance. The patient ends up paying $32 per unit so that you can receive your $52. Now, this is a great, you know, this is only one unit. Let's look at what it looks like on a real bill. So let's say this patient had a common procedure. It's a gastroscopy. There was a pre-op consultation. It's a 17610. Uh, these consultation items don't actually have unit values in the MBS, but we're giving it a value of two because that's actually what the ASA values this pre-op consultation at. Um, and it helps, you need to give it a unit value to be able to calculate fees on a unit, on a unit value rate. The, Item number for an anesthesia for a gastroscopy is 20740, and that attracts five units. And let's say it took 35 minutes in duration. As you know, there's 
one unit for each 15 minute period or part thereof for the first two hours. So it attracts three units, conveniently a total of 10 units for the service. Let's look at who pays what. On the left here, if you bulk bill the patient, Medicare always pays $15 per unit times 10 units, Medicare pays $150 for the service and that's what you'd receive for your 35 minute service. If instead the patient had insurance and you decided to no gap the patient, Medicare pays $150, the health fund pays $190 and you will receive $340. That's $34 fee um, unit rate times 10 units. If the patient was with a known gap health fund, so say Medibank private, and you still you wanted to receive that $52 per unit that you think your service is worth, the patient will end up with an out-of-pocket gap of $180. Between the health fund and Medicare, they have paid the same as if you no-gap the patient. If, however, you had signed up to a no-gap scheme with Bupa or HCF, and you still, for this particular service, wanted to receive $52 per unit, you can receive it. You send the whole bill to the patient for $520, but the health fund will actually contribute only 25% of the scheduled fee towards the service. Medicare will pay the same as they always do, which is 75% of the scheduled fee, and your patient will end up with an out-of-pocket fee of $320. Let's do another example with a bigger procedure. So let's the patient had a cesarean section. Um, again, a pre-up consultation. This is the induction item number here, 20850. Let's say it was pretty slow, two and a half hours, and you put in a block for post-operative pain relief, um, conveniently a total of 30 units. Let's look at how all of the payments work now. So it's all the same as the previous slide, except now multiplied by three because there are 30 units, not 10 units. If you bulk bill, you get $450 for Medicare. If you no gap, you get $1,020 and the patient pays nothing the health fund and Medicare take care of that $34 per unit. If instead you decide your service is worth $52 per unit, then if you build this way, the health fund and Medicare would still pay their no gap rate and there would be an out of pocket gap of $540 for the patient. If you've been paying attention, you would know that this is actually a problem. The health funds have a known gap limit of $500 per service. And in this case, you've actually breached that known gap limit by $40. You're actually not permitted under the contract you've signed with the health fund to bill them this way. If you do insist on receiving $1,560, which is your $52 times 30 units for this service, the only way to achieve that is to jump over to this scheme where you send the entire bill to the patient for $1,560 Medicare always makes the same contribution, but the health fund's contribution will drop down significantly to only $150, and the patient's gap will rise to $960. If you understand um, this system and you're on top of uh, the nuances, you may choose in this circumstance to actually reduce your fee by $40. You may say, look, I'm actually happy to receive only a $500 gap here, my total will be $1,520, but in doing so, you're gonna be saving your patient $420. This is one of the reasons you'd want whoever is doing your billing to understand the system. And perhaps if you'd sent them a bill that asked for $52 per unit, they would hopefully get back to you with an email and say, look, are you happy to accept $40 less the patient will save over $400. And you're completely within your rights to say, no, my fee is my fee. And you may choose to um, reduce your fee to make the patient's life easier. Right, if you are charging gaps, it's important that you get informed financial agreement. It used to be called informed financial consent from your patients. Um, what does that mean? The gold standard is that you have consent in writing prior to the procedure, which explains what the fee is and what the estimated gap is. There are multiple challenges to actually receiving this gold standard. 
One of them is a lot of the time you're going to have limited notice of your patients because particularly when you're starting out, you may end up filling in for somebody at the last moment. Um, patients are often added on at the last minute. There's emergencies and there's late add-ons and you don't have a huge opportunity to actually um, get hold of your patient beforehand. There's also uncertainty with the actual item number that you'll be billing, certainly with the duration, particularly if it's a surgeon that you're not familiar with, and with the modifiers and extra services you may be charging. So you may not yet know if you're going to end up putting in an art line to the patient or if they're ASA4 or not, because you haven't had a chance to assess them when you're hopefully giving them their informed financial agreement. Um, you, unfortunately, as the anaesthetist, often lack control in this. You uh, the information you have is limited by the information that's given to you. Um, and you also have an indirect relationship with the patient. The patient has gone to the surgeon, you are providing a service to the surgeon, and the surgeon's rooms don't always give you all the information you need. That being said, there are, a way, there are ways to get around it and to do the best job you possibly can. So the first thing is to really understand how the health fund and Medicare rebates work. And that's what the previous few slides were trying to explain to you. If you understand the circumstances in which the patient's fee may go up or down or the patient's gap may jump up, then you are better equipped to explain that it to the patient and get informed financial agreement from them. They certainly will not understand it. Um, you need to ensure that any uncertainty is clearly communicated to the patients. And that can be a verbal conversation with the patient where you explain that the system's complicated and you say to them, look, if your procedure is significantly longer than we expect it to be, or if there are complications, then your fee may be different to what I'm estimating it is now. You may want to obtain prepayments if you're concerned that the patient won't pay afterwards or hold credit card numbers um, if you're concerned about payment later. And certainly you as the anaesthetist are the only person in your whole billing world who is actually actually has any physical contact with the patient. So when you do see the patient, it's, it's a great opportunity to collect their contact and insurance details, um, particularly if they're in certain groups, which I will get to on the next slide. Um, and that is, the slide is about knowing the risks and understanding the red flag cases. What we do in my billing service for informed financial agreement is our doctors often get hold of us the day before the procedure or perhaps two days before, we will generate an estimate for the patient on our software. We will pick up the phone and call the patient. We'll explain to them what we expect the total fee to be, what we expect their gap to be. If they're insured, we will ask them to confirm that they are in fact insured. And we will um, explain to them the circumstances in which the fee may increase or decrease, which is typically due to time or complications. We'll then collect an email address from the patient and email the same information to them so that we not only have a verbal consent from them, but they have the same information in writing. We'll ask them to get back to us to acknowledge that they have received and they understand and agree to the information that they've been sent. We've experienced that when we do this, we have very, very few issues of non-payment from our patients. These are the red flag cases from my experience. So these are good things for you to look out for. Um, number one is obtain excellent informed financial agreement. If you do that, your problems are gonna be massively minimized with debt collection. Our red flag cases typically, and sometimes strangely, are cosmetic services, pediatric services, bariatric services, and dental services. Uh, for most of these cases, we get prepayment. Um, we found that with cosmetic cases, sometimes the patients are unhappy with the cosmetic outcome, the surgical outcome, and they decide to not pay the anaesthetist, where the anaesthetist had absolutely no control over that. Pediatric cases uh, shouldn't be an issue, but what we found is with family breakdowns, we sometimes found ourselves in the middle of a divorce, and parent one tells us it's parent two responsibility and parent two tells us it's the responsibility of parent one. So to avoid this, we just get prepayment for pediatric patients so we don't have to be involved in divorces. Bariatric cases, um, patients often don't have money. They sometimes need to access superannuation to finance their surgeries. 
and we found that they're sometimes unreliable paying afterwards, so we prefer to get prepayment from them. And dental, there are sometimes um, psychiatric issues involved. We find it's easier to get payment beforehand with dental patients. Um, CTP, so that's compulsory third party in New South Wales and in Queensland. Uh, often the patient's hit by a car or is in a vehicle accident. They end up in emergency at a public hospital and then have surgery. The hospital notes them down as a CTP patient and therefore won't pay the VMO for their time. And the VMO needs to charge the CTP insurer, who potentially is a driver that they've never met and never will meet. And it's particularly difficult to access information and to get claim details for these. Um, and the patient themselves, once they've been treated in the hospital and goes home, have absolutely no interest in collecting this information or in submitting a claim. So our advice is to get as much information as you possibly can from the patient and to educate the patient that they are required to submit a claim and to give you the claim data when they have it so that you can get paid for your services. The other red flag cases are overseas visitors and students. Uh, just by their nature, they sometimes leave the country. And if you haven't obtained information that travels with them, such as email addresses, then you're unable to get their insurance details and perhaps unable to chase payment at all. Um, follow up of unpaid accounts. <sighs> We do it multiple ways. Um, we do everything we can to ensure that our doctors get payment and that the patients are aware that they have invoices outstanding. Initially, invoices are sent either by mail, email, or SMS, depending on the information we have. And when, if a patient doesn't pay, we will follow them up. We find that SMS follow-ups are very effective because people access it instantly and it's in their hand. Um, and we find that they actually open their SMSs. We, if patients fail to pay by after some SMS messages, our team will pick up the phone and phone the patient. If we can't get hold of the patient, we'll call the surgeon's room and try to get next of kin details and do that as well. It can be quite uncomfortable doing this. We often hear um, really unfortunate stories from patients about why they can't pay. Um, and it may just be easier to have a third party doing this for you, but if you're comfortable doing it, then by all means, go ahead and do it yourself. The patient perhaps may be more likely to pay you because you were the service provider. For the health fund rejections, this is a world of pain. If you haven't billed the correct item numbers or if you have billed the correct item numbers and Medicare or the health fund has made a mistake in processing them, or if the patient's insurance isn't valid for a multiple multiple reasons, your claim may be rejected. And one of the only ways to get it paid is to pick up the phone, sit on hold for anywhere from a few minutes to 40 minutes to speak to an operator on the other side who will tell you that they're going to get it taken care of. And invariably, the person they send the request to won't action it and you'll have to rinse and repeat in a few weeks. Um, this is one of the main functions that we as a billing service do for our clients. We spend hours and hours chasing up their unpaid invoices from the health funds and Medicare. And it just requires a lot of time and persistence. If you have access to more work as an anaesthetist, you are going to be far better remunerated by working as an anaesthetist than by sitting on hold trying to speak to Medicare or HCF about an item number that hasn't been paid. Public and private is something quite new. Uh, it started mainly due to the waiting list backlog created by the COVID-19 shutdowns. Um, basically, their doctors enter into individual agreements with the private hospitals that treat waiting list patients. The payment for these services is typically not great, um, but it does depend on the agreement you have and you basically end up billing the private hospital for your service and getting paid by the private hospital and payment has been historically very slow. If you registered for GST, you would be adding GST onto these services, but you wouldn't for a typical medical service. Cosmetic surgery and GST. If you do end up doing any cosmetic surgery that does not uh, attract MBS item numbers, then 
it does it is not exempt from GST. So if you're registered for GST, um, you would need to add GST onto the cost of your service. MBS items for only medical services exclude GST. Um, they're exempt. So how do you know if the service attracts MBS item numbers or not? The idea is you follow the surgeon's lead. They've assessed the patient and they understand whether there's a medical service involved or whether this is purely cosmetic. So on the list, if there's no item number, then it's a cosmetic service. If there is an item number, then it is at least partially medical. Um, if there are no item numbers, there's no Medicare or health fund rebates. And um, you do have to charge GST if you're registered. Some services are partially medical and partially cosmetic. You would need to give your billing service the duration of only the medical portion of the service so we can apply the correct time item number. And then we'd need to apply GST to the uh, cosmetic part of the service if you're registered. Medicare provider numbers, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, you may find that some of the much older anaesthetists you've worked with will tell you that you only need one provider number to uh, work in private practice and you should use your home address as the location for this provider number. I think that's how it was historically done by people who didn't understand the system and they've never changed it because nobody's ever told them it's wrong or ever audited them or ever stopped paying them. There is absolutely no reason to use your home address. Firstly, it's not allowed by Medicare rules. Secondly, because we now have MyGov data and Medicare data online, your patients will be able to find you and come and knock on your door at home. There's no reason to have that. And there's absolutely no benefit to you. You should have a provider number for every location at which you work. So each different hospital you work at, um, you should have a unique provider number there and you should be using that provider number to bill for services provided at that hospital. Um, what that means is once you've generated all of these provider numbers and you can do that through PRODA online in real time, you need to then register each one of these with each of the private health funds so that they have your banking details to reimburse you when you um, when you do no gap claims. Uh, unfortunately, if you start using working at a new facility and you do get a new provider number, you then need to complete all of the health fund forms again. So it's an administrative nightmare created by Medicare, but those are the rules. Um, Medicare, and then sorry, with some of the health funds being HCF and Bupa, you can choose for each of those locations whether you sign up to their no gap scheme or to their known gap scheme. Medicare has been threatening for years to um, audit doctors who don't use the correct provider numbers for the places at which they work. Since you're about to start out, you may as well do it properly. Look into your crystal ball, figure out where you think you're going to be working at the in the future, generate provider numbers for each of those places and register them all with the health funds you do not need to have practicing rights at any of the facilities that you generate providers numbers for. You can just get yourself a provider number and be ready just in case you do work there one day. One of the reasons Medicare wants you to do this is they want to have accurate statistics for medical services. So if you have a provider number at RPA hospital and you're providing a lot of uh, anesthesia for gastroscopy services there, Medicare statistics want to know where those services are happening. Um, if you are trained overseas, you may be subject to Section 19AB of the Health Insurance Act. It's otherwise known as the 10-year moratorium, where you are not allowed to work outside an area of need for the first 10 years after you register as a medical specialist in Australia. Um, there are some very limited ways around this. If you want to have a chat about that, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, and the other thing that's really important is if you are a part-time staff specialist and you do private work outside, you do definitely need different provider numbers for that. For your staff specialist role, the hospital will be billing on your behalf with your provider number for that hospital. And for your and therefore the hospital will be collecting directly the rebates from the health funds and Medicare for your services at that hospital. Whereas for your private work um, at a different hospital, you want the health funds paying you directly. So you have to have different provider numbers for each of those. 
Um, that's the end of the presentation. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. You can call me or you can email me. Um, other thoughts, you may want to think about how you're going to set up your private practice and if you are going to use a billing service, who you use. I always recommend people ask their colleagues um, about their experiences. We find that most of our clients come to us through word of mouth. And ultimately, your billing service is the front for your business. So you want to choose someone that's reliable um, and someone that puts on a professional front for your business because your patients are going to interact with your billing service. So there is a bit of a race to the bottom as far as fees for um, billing. You can go for the cheapest option, but just be aware that you, whoever you choose is the face for your business. If you have any questions, get in touch with me.